Well, it's Friday evening and we've made it to the weekend once again, my dear friends. Now, if you haven't got anything too important to do, just stick with me for half an hour, because I've got a fantastic story for you this evening. It's from the incredibly talented Derek Hawk, Killer Hawk 1. And, well, let's just say, if you've been a good boy or girl, you've got nothing to worry about. But if you haven't, then better take heed to the story I've got lined up for you this evening. Well, my dear friends, I think it's time for you to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. God damn it, not again, screamed Ricky after opening the much-anticipated email. Pinche pendejo, he said even louder. Hijo de puta madre. He picked up his expensive mouse and threw it against the wall. Ay, ves a mi culo, puto. He slammed his fist down, shattering the tricked-out, top-of-the-line gaming keyboard. Ricky continued to stare at the message, the words mocking him from his computer screen. The message was topped with a large header and white font that stood in contrast to the black background. Right there, the two hated words that said, Story Deletion. Ricky is all too familiar with these words. In fact, he should be able to recite the entire message from memory by now. <laughs> story Deletion. Your story has been deleted because it doesn't meet the wiki's quality standards. If you feel that it did meet the standards, Please state your case on deletion appeal. Make sure you follow the instructions to the letter, or your appeal will be automatically denied. Do not attempt to re-upload your pasta. If you upload it again, you'll receive a one-day ban from editing, as per the rules. Oh, Ricky loves scary stories. The only thing he loves more than scary stories is writing scary stories. Sadly, there is one problem. Hmm, how do I put this? Well, the truth of the matter is, our friend Ricky here is, for the lack of better words, a shitty writer. There is zero talent in this poor boy's head, and the same can be said about his imagination too. His characters have no substance. His grammar is atrocious. His plot developments are non-existent. And his word choices are, might I say, infantile. In fact, I'd go so far as to say I've seen pigeon shit out more interesting narratives than this kid. Anyway, I digress. What's truly sad about this whole ordeal is that Ricky truly believes his stories are good. <laughs> no, he thinks they are great. The dark and sinister entities that inhabit the worlds he creates are far superior to anything seen in a movie or found on the internet, or so he believes. His dark tales are capable of tapping into the primordial pools of terror buried deep within our subconscious minds. That's what he expects his readers to find from every one of his works. Whereas you and I would see it for what it is. A juvenile, uninspired, boring piece of shit. Some have even gone as far as to say that his stories are so bad, looking at the words for too long will give you pink eye. One boy exclaimed, after being forced to listen from beginning to end, that Ricky's story gave him an ear infection. Well, whether any of that is true or not, it's a well-known fact that once you finish reading a story by Ricky... You were actually more stupid than you were before you started reading. Brain cells literally drop dead in the middle of whatever brain cells do in their brain cell lives. Believe me, it's not just a few, but a lot of them. Alas, poor Ricky will not hear it. He doesn't like rejection. And he already has it in his head that they're not even reading his stories. He is convinced they don't even bother to give him the time of day and automatically delete them. Oh, the tantrum builds, and his cheeks turn red as he screams out loud. 
Oh, why would they not listen to me? They never give me a chance. He knows this to be true, especially in consideration of how they treat him and what they say about his stories. He angrily reads the comments. Bad grammar and punctuation. But I'm new to this site. Can't you just tell me what to fix, or just fix it yourself? Misspelled words. Ah, but that's the way my character speaks. Poorly written and awkward sentences. Hey, English isn't my first language. Yeah, give me a chance. The story is not creepy. What do you mean it's not creepy? There's a fucking witch in the story. How's that not scary? You see, Ricky is a spoiled kid from a well-to-do family. Never has he had to go without. Never has his demand not been met. Never has his ungrateful heart ever been denied a single demand. There was nothing he could not have in his pampered life. However, with such a luxurious lifestyle, he's also never had to dream or aspire for greater things. Despite his value, all the objects of his desire were carelessly tossed to the side, or forgotten when interest was lost. They meant nothing to him. Well, that will change tonight. That is why I have been sent. That is my charge from Milidama. Tonight, I will reveal to him the stories of his people and where he comes from. I will bring knowledge under the cover of night. With his last breath, he will learn this final lesson. Thou shalt not suffer the cries of a spoiled child. And who am I? Well, let's just say that I'm someone who is familiar with matters such as these. So, when the boy lays his head upon his pillow and closes his eyes to sleep, he will be unaware of the small leather pouch tucked ever so carefully beneath him. It will call out to her. It will summon her, and she will come. She will drink, even though her thirst for revenge can never be quenched. She will feed her hate though its hunger can never be satisfied. To understand the events soon come to pass, we must look to the past. Understand this. The more that days go by, the more that things stay the same. Long ago, the people of Mexico suffered from the deeds of corrupt men and endured the cruelty of the true rulers of the land, the cartels. While savagery and brutality swept across the plains and darkened the skies like a cloud of locusts, a small village near the city of Catimajo, Mexico, prospered. It remained a tranquil, safe haven, untouched by the evils of men. In those days, the villages were weak and vulnerable. They could not defend themselves against the powerful and corrupt men, infected with the sickness of greed. Government and town officials lined their pockets with the sweat and blood of the poor. No justice or protection ever came for the people. Farmers' crops were plundered and destroyed. Workers were kept in constant poverty. Their sons would be taken against their will by the banditos to replenish their numbers. Alas, it was the daughters of Mexico who suffered the most. Many mothers and fathers could only mourn before a single lit candle, for there was not a body to bury for the funeral. They would live their lives never knowing what became of their beloved child. Too many shallow graves sprinkled the countryside with the bones from the unnamed girls. Among this violence, all but one village suffered. Those of questionable character and darkness in their hearts would not dare enter the borders of this town, for its people were under the protection of a powerful curandera. Her name was known from afar 
and her magic was strong. The evil men knew this to be true, and they would not risk her wrath upon them. This ate away at their egos, and soon they began to conspire among themselves. In secret and darkened rooms, they plotted how to be rid of this meddlesome woman. Early one morning, the Hurandera awoke to the sound of a child's cry. It was not a cry of terror, but a cry of pain. She ran out of her small house to see a boy sitting on the dirt path that ran alongside her home. Next to him was an old bike. Hitched to the rear wheel was a weathered cart carrying a large wooden box. He sat, crying on the ground, clutching both his arm and leg. Even from a distance, she could see the two painful welts upon the boy's skin. The Corandera knew precisely what had happened, and took a glass jar of salve from off her shelf. She went out to the boy and warmly said, ¿Qué pasa, mijo? What's the matter, little boy? No answer came from the boy. A little irritated, she asked, ¿Te pico algo? Did something sting you? ¿Fue una hormiga o una avispa? Was it an ant or a wasp? Again, the boy said nothing. The Hurandera was becoming annoyed. She looked carefully at the boy, who sat silently before her. From the clothes he wore, she knew he was a rich man's son, most likely the child of an elected official or a member of the town's elite. She gently applied the medicine to the two painful stings. The skin was hot and bright red surrounding a lump the size of a large grape. When she finished, the boy simply turned and jumped on his bike and pedaled away without a word. This angered the Hurandera, and she made a mental note. Yes, in the very near future, someone will need to teach this boy some manners and the importance of respecting his elders. Shortly thereafter, the Kurandera went about her day-to-day -day business and forgot all about the rude little boy. That night, after the Kurandera had laid her head down to sleep, she awoke to a loud bang. Her door had been broken down by several large men. They bound her hands and gagged her mouth to prevent any chance she might utter a hex upon them. They took her wand, made out of the sacred Huatulco wood, and snapped it in two. They removed her Sajo de Coración medicine bag from around her neck, leaving the poor woman completely defenseless now. The man dragged the woman before the town's clergy, who were the most corrupt of them all. Denied any opportunity to defend herself, the curandera was accused of witchcraft and blamed for this year's drought and the poor harvest. They said she was in league with the devil, and proclaimed her to be a bruja. They sentenced her to death. The onlookers cheered upon hearing the verdict. She looked across the crowd, and mourned at what she saw. The faces she had known for so long. Those faces who came to her when they were sick or needing healing were gone and in their place were hateful and dark eyes, filled with the bloodlust of an angry mob. She stood on a platform next to a short, thin coffin that stood upright. The crowd shouted and jeered as they grew impatient. She closed her eyes and tried to center herself amongst the shouts of swears and insults. The Curandera began to pray. She prayed to the Holy Mother for deliverance. She begged and pleaded to her for protection. She pleaded with all her might. She begged the Holy Mother with desperation, proclaiming her good deeds done and righteous life that she'd lived. Only silence greeted the Curandera. The crowd suddenly grew quiet, and the Curandera opened her eyes. She saw the crowd separate in the middle and make a path for a little boy. 
the familiar child rode an old bike and pulled a cart with a box. He dismounted the bike and walked around to the rear, opened the box that sat upon the cart, and carefully removed a large burlap sack. He held the bag at arm's length and quickly brought it and its contents to the clergyman. As the man of God took hold of the sack, the boy looked up at the woman, smiled, and disappeared into the sea of bodies within the mob. Still bound, she was marched relentlessly to the edge of town. All the way, she was beaten and humiliated by the people who followed along. She was brought before a freshly dug grave and shoved hard into the open coffin. She stared up at the men mocking her from above. Just as they were about to seal the coffin shut, the clergyman held up his large hand with the burlap sack. He flung the bag into the coffin, and the men quickly nailed the lid closed. The men picked up the coffin containing the curandera and dropped it into the dark hole. The sound of dirt covering the coffin was loud and thunderous. The curandera lay terrified in the pitch dark. Just before the light had been extinguished, she saw what had been tossed in here with her. At her feet lay the largest wasp nest she had ever seen. Soon she felt hundreds of thin legs begin crawling all over her body. They angrily explored this dark prison as they searched for the one who dared to disturb them. Time slowed as the curandera waited for the first sting to strike her. Once again, she prayed to the Blessed Mother for protection, and still there was only silence. Pain from the first sting exploded over her right cheek. The sharp stinger was stabbed into her flesh. It tore through the skin and went as deep as it could. The wasp contracted its abdomen slightly, pumping its venom into its victim. It pulled out its sharp tip and again jabbed the stinger back into her flesh. For the wasp can use their stingers over and over again. Even if they have exhausted their venom, they will still pierce your skin over and over again. She screamed in pain as she was stung again and again and again. They stung her eyes and crawled into her open mouth and stung her tongue. The insects crawled down her throat and into her ears. Venom filled her blood and her skin turned red as it swelled and burned. The wasp's poison saturated her blood causing it to thicken and burn. The swelling cut off her breathing, and she began to convulse. This angered the little beasts, and they stabbed at her more relentlessly. Blood trickled from every puncture. Not a single spot on her body was spared from the wasp's stings. The pain continued to grow. Never did it lessen. She was about to call out to the Virgin Mother. Then she stopped herself. Betrayal and abandonment hit her deeply, causing more agony than any wasp could bestow. Anger and hate consumed the woman. She knew what she had to do. She would call out to another deity. Yes, this deity would come. She would call out... For Santa Muerta. Santa Muerta, I call unto thee. I offer myself to thee. I deny the Holy Mother. I deny the Father. I deny the Son. I deny the Holy Spirit. Take me, and I will do thy bidding. The Hrander laid motionless in the darkness, wheezing and gasping for air. Her stings upon her skin were stretched until it tore from the swelling. The swarm of insects continued to poke and jab with their long stingers. 
The buzzing of their wings was deafening. And then, suddenly, all was silent. The scraping of long nails travelled down the side of the coffin. The Corandera tried to open her eyes, but her face was far too bloated. It mattered not that she had not sight, as the wasp stingers had penetrated her eyelids and filled her eyes with venom too. The scraping stopped, and the Corandera heard the low and ancient voice of a woman speak. Ketepika, mihiha. What's the matter, my daughter? The crowd had not yet dispersed when the ground began to shake. The men had lingered and were congratulating themselves and laughing when the ground opened up. Black thorns emerged from the soil where the Hurandera laid, and the dirt blackened with decay. All was still for a moment until a deep and inhuman moan was heard from the sky. The villagers cowered when the low voice boomed from the cracks that spread out from the spot of the woman's unholy grave. I curse you. I curse your children. They will taste the venom that now flows in my veins. When I hear a child cry, I will come. I will come for your children. They will feel my sting. I will nest within a home made from their skin. I will use their bones for stirring my brew. I will quench my thirst with their tears. I will dance to a melody made from a symphony of their screams. She let out one final wail of demonic rage until only the sound of wasp wings rising out of the ground could be heard. Three days later, the traitorous boy, with the waspings by the Curandera home, had disappeared without a trace. It was fate that brought the two together. He had been tasked with finding a wasp nest. It was by chance that two of the insects escaped and stung the boy by the Curandera's home. She had shown him mercy, and he had repaid her with rudeness and betrayal. An empty bed was all they found, except for the small pouch hidden underneath his pillow. Within the sack, they found only a piece of a paper wasp's nest, ash and a lock of hair cut from the boy's head. She still keeps a part of him on her at all times, even to this very day. As time went by, more and more of the children disappeared. Eventually, like the righteous Corandera, the little village died a slow and painful death. The people in that area still speak of the dark Bruja. It is told that when the days shorten and the nights grow cold, the children must be especially good and obedient. For if a child is spoiled and shows no respect, the Bruja will find you. They say she is dressed all in black and wears a cloak made of wasps. She can fly long distances and climb up walls. She will tap on your window and tempt the child to let her in. Her nails will click and tap on the window pane until the child hears her voice from out of the darkness. So, that is the story of La Bruja. She is the one I serve. She is my lady, and I serve her well. I find those children who are spoiled and rotten. I find the ones most deserving of the fate my lady brings. And who am I? Well, that is a story for another time. However, I will tell you this. I am neither angel nor demon. I do perform God's will. I bring balance. That is my mandate from the Heavenly Father. The Bruja has no mercy. She holds dark and powerful magic fueled by an unexhaustible source of hatred and rage. I direct that rage to those deserving of it. Such hatred and wickedness cannot be allowed to roam free and go unchecked. I ensure 
the innocent are protected, and the wicked are punished. So, listen to my words, little boy or little girl. Do what you are told. Honor your mother and father. Be on your best behavior. You don't want to end up like Ricky here now, do you? Take heed, for if you do not, there will come a night when you will hear tapping at your window. As the buzzing of a thousand wings fill your ears, you will hear the low voice of a woman asking, Que te pica, mi hijo? What's the matter, my child? Yeah, that's definitely one of the favourite things about um, reading these stories. I know that some of these authors are going to go on to be incredibly famous in the future. Brilliant story there from Killerhawk1. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, well, a um, couple of uh, series I'm going to be rounding off next week. I know I keep saying that, I really do, but this time I promise, okay? So, um, The Secret Room Under the uh, Kitchen, definitely finishing next week. And I hope to resume Dead Man Running too. Oh my god, you'd forgotten about that one, hadn't you? Well, it's been revised, and it's even better than before, so part five is coming up next week as well. Now, I've said it, haven't I? So I've got to do it. <laughs> okay, well, that's enough for me for one evening. You have a great weekend, and I'll be back again on Monday. Sweet dreams, and bye-bye for now. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>